Greetings, this is Craig. I would like to talk about what I think are some hugely underappreciated British contributions to World War II aviation. Now, I don't want to discuss the famous airplanes they built or the chain home radar system or any of the other things that are talked about all the time. I want to talk about the stuff that isn't brought up very often and when it is, the British origins are usually not mentioned or the importance is understated. Let's start with water injection. Sometimes it can be used as or called water methanol or water alcohol injection. I'll just call it water injection for the purposes of this video. Water injection was initially figured out in Britain by Sir Harry Ricardo, probably the most important British engineer of the war, maybe of all time, especially in regards to aircraft engines. I don't think many people know of water injection's British origins, or really understand how much of a factor it was during the war. Ironically, the British themselves did not use water injection to any meaningful extent during World War II. Neither the Rolls-Royce Merlins and Spitfires, nor the similar Packard Merlins and P-51 Mustangs used in combat had water injection, although the very late war P-51H variant did have it and used it to great effect. Harry Ricardo did a lot of very influential work, not only on water injection, but on all sorts of anti-knock factors like air fuel ratios, combustion chamber design, and more. It's quite common to see him listed as a reference in U.S. NACA reports. The high manifold pressure values run in Allied airplanes had a lot to do with his work, and some of the largest increases seen were from water injection. I suppose I could say that with all of his work, Harry Ricardo himself was one of the largest British contributions. His book is still a valuable resource for performance engine designers and builders, even today. Of course, it's out of copyright, so I put it in the Patreon section. The biggest contributions from water injection were seen in the U.S. fighters powered by air-cooled radials. These include the FM2 Wildcat, as well as the F6F Hellcat, which eventually got water injection, as did the F4U Corsair, and of course, Republic's P47 Thunderbolt. This allowed the Pratt & Whitney R2800 to remain very competitive, in fact, more than competitive throughout the war. The early P47 Thunderbolts had 2,000 horsepower from their R2800s, which was fine, but over time, horsepower went up to 2,300, then 2,600, ultimately 2,800 horsepower in a P-47 Mike or November. All of these increases were made possible by water injection. A Thunderbolt with 2,000 horsepower would not have been competitive in mid-1944 or beyond, at least not at low or mid-range altitudes. But with the power increases allowable with water injection, it had great performance throughout the war. The Corsair and Hellcat probably would have been okay without it when fighting the Japanese, at least for the most part. However, there were some late war Japanese fighters that could give either of those airplanes a great fight if the Japanese fighters were flown by an experienced pilot. But water injection kept the Corsair and Hellcat at or near the top of the food chain in the Pacific theater throughout the war. Of course, the Germans and Japanese both used water injection as well. In fact, before the war, when everyone was still sharing and playing nice, Hermann Goering actually gave Sir Harry Ricardo an award for his work in this area. So, in a sense, this technology benefited the Axis as well. However, the Japanese didn't make very effective use of it. Too few planes had it, and in any case, uh, it was just too little too late. On the other hand, the Germans had it operational relatively early, but they couldn't get it to work on the plane that needed it the most, the FW-190 Anton. Had they got that to work, it would have been a real problem, but thankfully for the Allies, they ran into some serious roadblocks with this project, which I'll cover when I get around to finishing my FW-190 series. The Messerschmitt BF-109 did use water injection in some cases, and to good effect, so did the FW-190 Dora 9, but by then those planes were being overwhelmed by Allied numbers, and the Thunderbolts, of course, had water injection too. In fact, by about mid-1944, Thunderbolts were approved to run 70 inches of manifold pressure, 
giving over 2,700 horsepower. The improvements to the P-47's performance were important, even critical, because it was the Thunderbolt, more than the other Allied fighters, that had to take the fight to the enemy when the Luftwaffe was still a serious force to be reckoned with. The P-38 Lightnings had been sent to the Mediterranean, and by the time the P-51 Mustangs outnumbered the P-47 Thunderbolts, well, by then the Luftwaffe was already pushed back far enough so that the Normandy invasion on D-Day would be largely free from air opposition, and most of the experienced German fighter pilots were dead by this point. The Spitfires were, of course, great flying airplanes, but they couldn't take the fight very far into enemy territory. Of course, the Germans had been incurring losses on the Eastern Front this whole time, no doubt about that, but not at a rate great enough to destroy the Luftwaffe via attrition, at least not in any kind of timely manner. In order for D-Day to happen on time, a lot rested on the Thunderbolts in regards to smashing the Luftwaffe, and water injection was one of the key pieces of technology that helped them do that. The next thing I want to talk about is a little less clear, but also very important. Before I get to that, I want to say that if you have doubts that it was the Thunderbolt more than any other fighter which pushed back the Luftwaffe prior to D-Day, please watch this video. I have all the supporting data there. There is no point or need to cover it all again now. Next, I want to talk about drop tanks on fighter planes. No, the British didn't invent them. Various air forces around the world had been using them well before World War II. However, in the U.S., drop tanks were not being seriously developed for fighters to the same extent. In fact, it was U.S. Army Air Corps and later U.S. Army Air Force policy not to use drop tanks and not to fund any development of drop tanks. Now, various aircraft companies did want to equip their fighters with drop tanks. However, the U.S. Army Air Corps simply said no. In this book, and notice who wrote the preface to it, we find that Curtis wanted to fit a drop tank to the P-36, but the idea was rejected. We even have a specific U.S. Army Air Corps document on this subject from May of 1939. It clearly states that the Chief of the Air Corps, Hap Arnold at the time, decrees that no tactical aircraft, so that would include fighters, would be equipped with drop tanks. There is an important caveat which says that if Curtis, or I think by default any other aircraft company, wants to develop such a system at their own expense, that's okay. The result was that some U.S. companies did configure their fighters for drop tanks, largely for two reasons. First, in some cases there was overlap with requirements for the U.S. Navy, who didn't have such a prohibition. I'm simplifying this, but some companies, like Lockheed, built planes for both the Navy and the Air Force, and so there was some crossover of technology among the product line. That's why you see very similar looking drop tanks on the Navy's Lockheed Ventura and on P-38 Lightnings. In fact, in some cases, they are literally the same tank. Second, it was felt that some foreign customers would want drop tanks on the U.S. fighters, if not for operational use, then possibly to simplify delivery issues. In actuality, Europeans were not seriously moving forward with drop tanks until after World War II started to heat up, which is a bit strange because drop tanks had been around for a long time. In fact, during the Spanish Civil War, the Condor Legion used drop tanks, and even the actual Luftwaffe planes in Germany were using them as well. Nobody seemed to notice, though, and even the Germans forgot about this idea for a while. Over on the other side of the world, the Japanese were making very effective use of drop tanks on their fighters in their war with China. However, nobody in the Western world really paid attention. The U.S. Army Air Force just didn't care about drop tanks. I have an entire video on this, but the short version is that some of the U.S. leadership had their collective heads in the sand and felt that a dollar spent on anything that wasn't a bomber was a dollar wasted. Even when the bomber losses over Europe started to mount, it took a while before they woke up and smelled the coffee. Initially, they wanted to solve the problem by using either B Martin B-26 Marauders as some sort of heavy escort fighter or have super heavily armed B-17 Flying Fortresses mixed into the formation. Neither plan worked out and they finally decided that the only solution was to add drop tanks to the P-47 Thunderbolts. Keep in mind, most P-38 Lightnings that were in Europe had been sent to the Mediterranean 
and North African theaters, plus the Lightning had its own set of problems when operating in the European theater. Now the P-51B model Mustang with the extended range tanks were not an option yet at this point. So this is where the British come in to sort of help save the day. Most P-47s by this point at least had the provisions for drop tanks. That means they had the plumbing and the mounting points already built into the airplane, and that's fortunate because if the planes weren't already set up for it, then getting drop tanks onto the P-47s in Europe would have been a much bigger and more time-consuming project. Now, details on this are sketchy, but it's my opinion that the main reason Bell's P-39 Era Cobra, Curtis's P-40 Warhawk, Kitty Hawk, whatever variant, and Republic's P-47 Thunderbolt had provisions for drop tanks during the period when the U.S. Army Air Force had a prohibition on drop tanks has a lot to do with the fact that all of these companies were selling or providing via Lend-Lease planes to the British. As you can see, that's a theory put forth in Dragon's Teeth as well, and considering who wrote the foreword and the evidence we can just see by looking at the airplanes, I think it's reasonable. Another factor, and this one is not a theory, is that while the U.S. was setting up to build drop tanks once they decided to so equip their fighters, the British had a drop tank already set up and ready to go on the Thunderbolt. This was the 108-gallon British drop tank, and these were used on Thunderbolts as early as August of 1943. Famously, the U.S. suffered huge losses of unescorted bombers in the two raids on Schweinfurt. This was unnecessary, as drop tanks were available for the Thunderbolts for both of those raids. In October of 43, after the second Schweinfurt raid, the U.S. Air Force, the 8th Air Force specifically, finally had their come-to-Jesus moment and stopped sending bombers on unescorted daylight raids. It's a common misconception that they stopped bombing entirely until the P-51 showed up, but that's not true. Of course, the winter weather had an effect on the frequency of the missions flown, but escorted missions with P-47 Thunderbolts continued. The changes were mainly that now the U.S. heavy bombers only flew escorted missions, and of course that now the P-47s had drop tanks. This particular chart shows the percentage of bombers lost, and as you can see, once the escort started, the bomber losses never again rose as high in terms of percentage as they were before November of 1943. So where did this sudden supply of drop tanks come from? They had been essentially forbidden by the USAAF and thus were relatively rare. There were few US-made drop tanks in theater at the point at which the switchover in philosophy was made. Well, the British came through for us here with the 108-gallon unit. Thunderbolts could carry one under the belly, which was usually enough, but sometimes they could carry two more under the wings. This is probably my favorite drop tank of the war. Yes, I have a favorite drop tank. It's the one I always take in simulations. It's not the best one in terms of added drag. The US 75 gallon tank was much better in that regard. But the British 108 holds what for a lot of missions is just the right amount of fuel. And more importantly, it was there when it was needed. An added bonus is that these were made out of paper, believe it or not, which meant that in an era of metal scarcity, you're not delivering metal to your enemy for recycling when you drop the tanks over enemy territory. The bottom line here is that it's quite likely that the only reason the U.S. airplanes already had the provisions to carry drop tanks is because of the British. Without those built-in features, it would have taken much longer to get the drop tanks on the planes, and that could have delayed the destruction of the Luftwaffe by a couple of months. If you extrapolate that, it means pushing D-Day back two months, which then skews the numbers in the Battle of the Bulge towards the Germans. Now, even if I'm not on solid ground here, let's say that it just so happened that Republic decided to add those features to the planes at their own expense, and thus the planes were ready to take the drop tanks in serious numbers by mid-October of 43. Well, that doesn't change the scenario much because it was the British-made paper tanks that were in theater ready to go. Of course, various U.S.-made tanks started to show up pretty soon and in great numbers, but again, if you push the destruction of the Luftwaffe back just a little bit, it throws off the plans for D-Day.
I don't think the British ever seem to get credit for the importance of the drop tanks and especially that of the paper 108 gallon tank. Next up, we have dual superchargers on a single shaft. Dual stage supercharging was not new. The US had this for some time. What made the British system special was the fact that they put both supercharger impellers on a single shaft spinning at the same speed. While this isn't ideal for performance, it's a lot better than a single stage unit. Most importantly, it can fit into a very compact space, which was essential for use on a Spitfire or Mustang. The US dual stage systems, whether mechanically or exhaust driven, required a lot of space. Not a big problem behind a big air-cooled radial, but it's not going to fit into a P-51 Mustang. Without this development, the Spitfire and the P-51 would not have been competitive in mid-1944 and would have had relatively poor high-altitude performance, certainly not good enough to escort the U.S. turbocharged four-engine bombers. After the war, this technology, as it applies to piston engines, sort of fell by the wayside. In the rare cases when dual stages are still used, they're usually set up another way entirely, but the British system was brilliant in terms of space savings and it was a real engineering challenge to get the sizing of the impellers right in relation to each other, and this had to be just right since the speeds couldn't be varied independently. All in all, it's impressive and it was important to the Allied war effort. Next up, I want to talk about something for the bombers. The four-engine U.S. heavies had four ways of aiming bombs they would drop from high altitude. Visually, H2X, GH and Micro H. H2X and GH were very British. Micro H was kind of British, so I'll focus on the former two. Understand that I do think most people understand that H2X and GH were British. What I don't think most people understand is the massive increase in bombing allowed by these developments. H2X was airborne radar. It allowed the bomber crew to get a radar picture of the area to be bombed, and with some degree of accuracy, they could identify specific areas. Really good operators in good conditions could even pick out ships and bridges, but more often than not, it was used to hit or not hit larger geographical areas, coastlines, cities, or even specific sections of cities. This was used on D-Day. The Normandy coast was covered by an overcast, yet U.S. bombers were able to hit just a few hundred yards past the beach to create havoc among the enemy, but without hitting a single Allied ship. H-2X allowed that, and the German resistance on D-Day would have been much higher without it. They were able to do this because of the resolution on the H-2X scope. It was good enough so that the operators could match up the image on the scope to photos of the coastline, and I think that's pretty impressive for 1944 technology. GH worked on another principle entirely. The GH system was conceived by the British as a navigational system, but turned into a way to drop bombs onto a target you can't see. I'm going to simplify this, but it's basically a system that measures range to a GH station. If you fly at a specific range from that station, say 100 miles from it, and maintain that distance, you will, of course, fly a curved path, and that's exactly what they did, but they flew at a range at which the curved path would fly over the target. They also received information from a second station, which would then tell them where on the curved path they were, because those true curved paths are going to intersect at a specific point. Think of it this way. If you know your distance from two stations, and you know that you're east of them, because that's the direction you flew after you took off, then you know where you are. I should mention that not only was GH a British invention, the stations were manned by the British and all of the calculations were provided to the 8th Air Force before the missions, and these calculations were also done by the British. GH had a range limitation of about 200 miles, and the planes using it had to be able to receive the station, hence the range limitation. The comparative accuracy of the two systems depends on altitude, range from the station for GH and more. Each was better under certain conditions. So why bother with three systems, H2X, GH, and Micro-H, 
Well, keep in mind, we're looking at this stuff with the benefit of 2020 hindsight. During the war, the Allies didn't know which one would be best, and they also had to consider that the Germans might come up with a way to counter one of them through jamming or some other type of countermeasures, which to some extent the Germans did. So to avoid having all their eggs in one basket, the Allies had multiple methods of bombing targets through an overcast cloud layer. What I think most people don't know is just how often these systems were used. Take a look at this chart. As you can see, in June of 1944, the combined number of bombing raids which with H2X and GH exceeded the number of raids done visually. And from September, uh, or at least from September on, H2X alone was used on more raids than any other method. Now, the accuracy of these methods was not equal to visual raids using the Norden bomb site. But it wasn't as bad as you might think. As you can see in this chart, in good weather conditions, visual bombing would get about 80% of the bombs within a mile of the target, and that's pretty good. GH would get about 60% of them in there. And in terms of accuracy for these runs, which were at high altitudes, H2X lags behind for the most part. But we need to keep in mind that even with a solid overcast, H2X will get 50% of the bombs within a five mile range, which is accurate enough to hit a city, although not a really specific target like a factory or an airfield. The main advantage of H2X is that it can be used on a target out of range of GH and on days when visual bombing wasn't an option. Now we need to keep in mind that accuracy comparisons here aren't entirely even or fair if that term applies because the H2X and GH systems were in many cases being used when due to the weather, visual bombing wasn't even an option. So the choice was 50% of the bombs hitting the city or no bombs hitting the city. It's also important to note that H2X and GH allowed the bombers to be launched when the weather forecast was for the target to be overcast. But many times in reality, the clouds over the target cleared up and a visual attack was made. So of all the visual attacks on the chart, some of those were made possible by this newer technology, even when it wasn't used on the actual bombing run. Let's go back to talking about fighters. The last thing on my list is the gyro gun sight. During the First World War, fixed metal gun sights were the norm, but they had some serious limitations, mainly that the pilot's head has to be in a certain spot to line up the fore and aft components of the sight. That's hard to do in a maneuvering airplane. Very late in the war, the reflector gun sight was introduced, which became the norm by the Second World War. The reflector gun sight is constructed in such a way that the pilot's head doesn't need to be in an exact position to use the sight. I think it'll be easiest to demonstrate this via simulation. So we're in the FW-190 a8 Normandy map DCS simulator and take a look at the crosshairs and you'll see that as I move my head around they stay in the same place. That's the whole point of the reflector sight. It also has gradients on it to help you estimate range or certain versions will have different sizes of rings. We're closing in on a Spitfire here. It's imperative that we take him out before he sees us and we've done just that. Uh, four cannons will do that for you. His propeller has stopped. He's on fire. And now what we're going to do is turn 90 degrees from the direction of the smoke because people see that smoke and fly towards it. So I want to be as far away from there as I can get in the shortest amount of time. And most likely going out to sea will be the better choice here. Let's take a look in this British manual, which has guidelines on deflection shooting. As you can see, it's easy in principle, but in practice, it's quite difficult. Feel free to pause and try these exercises and you will probably find them a bit tougher than you may have initially thought. Now try to imagine doing them during the stress of combat while flying an airplane. The truth was, very few fighter pilots were good deflection shooters. Some were. As we saw in the RAF manual, they did put some emphasis on it. So did the Germans, although their manual is a lot more fun. Sorry I had to censor this. Uh, blame the overseers. The U.S. Army Air Force focused on deflection shooting as well and by late in the war had pilots practice uh, by shooting at towed banners. 
Although I should mention that early in the war, gunnery practice in the U.S. Army Air Force was incredibly minimal. Of course, all of these gunnery manuals are in the Patreon section, uncensored and complete, and they are pretty good. So if you want to learn more about how reflector sights were used to estimate ranges and angles for deflection shooting, you can do that. That said, successful deflection shooting with standard reflector sights was not relatively common. Most of the top aces of the war preferred to fire from very close range, so close there really wasn't much of a need to lead the target. I think I can count on one hand the famous aces who were known for deflection shooting. One is the Canadian ace George Burling, who studied this particular subject very hard and essentially taught himself to do it. Another one was the German uh, Hans Joachim Marseille. But then along came the gyro sight, which was largely developed by the British, and it made accurate deflection shooting a reality even for less experienced pilots. As seen in this Air Force journal, there were very high expectations for the US K-14 gyro sight, but of course there were also some skeptics. However, the site quickly proved itself. For some reason, the article doesn't name the pilot they're referring to here, but I'm certain it's William Wisner. He shot down six planes in one day using the gyro site and returned with ammunition left. I wouldn't call him inexperienced, far from it. This occurred on his second tour of duty flying in Europe, and he had been George Preddy's wingman. But there is no doubt that the gyro site helped him, especially considering the relatively low ammunition uh, amount of ammunition carried by the P-51 Mustang. I suppose the fact that one of the P-51s he flew was named Princess Elizabeth ties into the subject matter here too. However, that wasn't the name of the plane or the nose art chosen by William Wisner. It was forced upon him by command as Princess Elizabeth was going to visit the base. So now we're in our P-47D-40 and we have the K-14 reflector sight right in front of us. The first thing to notice is this ring here and the little X right in the center. That's the standard reflector sight portion of it. In other words, that's not affected by the gyro. The star in the middle, which has a dot in the center, you can't see because it's covered up by the cross, that star moves around to tell you just how much you're going to need to lead the target. And there are two things you'll have to put in. One is wingspan. And uh, in DCS, I click it and move the cursor up and down to move the wingspan slider left or right. And I'm probably going to want to set it here to about 66 feet because a little bit later we're going to be shooting down a JU-88 to show you how this works. And it has a 66 foot wingspan. Then you have the range setting here from 600 feet to about 2400. And you want to leave it at minimum range. You want to leave it at 600 feet and then zoom it out to uh, match the target that you're going to shoot at. That's the procedure per the manual. Next, let's hop into the airplane in flight and shoot down that JU-88. Now we're in the P-47, coming up on the White Cliffs of Dover here, chasing down a JU-88. Note I have my wingspan adjusted on the gun sight to 66 feet. That's the right amount for this airplane. And I have the distance set for 2,000 feet. So instead of selecting the distance to match the target, I'm going to gain on the airplane until it's at the right range. I'm using 2,000 feet because that's a little bit outside of the effective range of the JU-88's defensive firepower, but well within the range of my 50 cals. So as soon as the range looks just right and the dot is on the target, I'll squeeze the trigger. Notice it takes very fine movements on the controls to, to do this. It's uh, an exercise in being steady and having some patience. So right when it's on there uh, and at the right range, I will squeeze the trigger. And we should see that any second here. There we go. So we're firing and we're getting hits. We can see that because of the smoke. Now I want to break off. I want to make myself a harder target for the JU-88's gunners who are probably still active. But the plane's on fire. I know time is on my side here. The crew is not going to get that fire out, not at this altitude. So I'll just keep my distance until I, until I start to see some shoots. And then we'll go in for a closer look and make absolutely certain the plane is going to go down. <laughs> 
and it looks like they're still in the fight they're taking shots at us but the range is way too far even if I didn't jink or anything they have no chance really of hitting me from this range now I'll start angling back towards the the target and also back towards Dover and there's a parachute there's another parachute so they're bailing out we'll normally see four parachutes assuming the entire crew survived the attack uh, looks like the plane is certainly going down and we'll just follow it here just for the the uh, visual excitement I suppose definitely on fire definitely shot up and you can see as I maneuver how that gyro position moves around so it's difficult to aim the gyro sight if you're in a real hard twisting and turning dogfight and that's why you have the the fixed ring there as well so splash one ju88 this is a page from the U.S. 8th Air Force Tactical Development document, which is, of course, in the Patreon section. As you can see, the K-14 site was a direct descendant of the British Mark II gyro site and was installed in P-38s, 47s, and 51s. The British had done the vast majority of the pioneering work on this technology, and the U.S. design, the K-14, simply piggybacked off of that. The Germans came out with their own gyro site called the EZ-42. This was largely because they started finding K-14s in wreckages of U.S. aircraft. Apparently, there was a comparison done by the Germans during the war between the K-14 and their EZ-42. Reportedly, the EZ-42 was found to be more accurate. I've not been able to get my hands on that actual report, but I think the story is believable. However, the EZ-42 had some drawbacks as compared with the K-14. First of all, the German pilot had to set a dial to compensate for every 2,000 meter change in altitude, in addition to the normal settings, of course, for uh, distance and wingspan. The EZ-42 also lacks the fixed reticle as seen on the K-14, so if the German pilot wants to use it as a fixed reflector sight, he can do that, but he has to turn off the gyro with a switch that's up on the site itself on the right hand side. As the fixed reticle is always displayed on the K-14, it's easier for the pilot using the K-14 site to transition between gyro and, and fixed modes. The reason this matters is because both of these sites require about two seconds on the target in a relatively steady state for the gyro to settle in and give accurate results. That's fine if you're in a steady state turn or lining up on a bomber that's maneuvering very slowly, but against an enemy fighter that's aggressively trying to stay out of your gun sight, it's going to be a problem. The solution is, of course, to switch over to the fixed reticle when you're in that situation, but once you do that with the EZ-42, the gyro starts to spin down, and it takes a while to spin it back up if you want to go back to gyro mode. In practice, at least in simulation in my own experimentation, I find that it's best to leave the EZ-42 in gyro mode. I set it to about 400 meters, and then if I get into a tough maneuvering dogfight, which I generally try to avoid with the FW-190s, which are the planes that have this sight, in that situation, I shut down the gyro and use the EZ-42 as a standard fixed reflector sight. I suspect that's what the German pilots did in the war. I've never seen a wartime picture of a 109 with an EZ-42, so I'm not sure if the 109s were ever so equipped. Few EZ-42s were made. There were only about 200 of them, and that was fortunate. Had the Germans had these in, fight, in their fighters before the U.S. fighters were escorting the heavy bombers, the German fighters using the EZ-42 and their 20mm cannons could have shredded the bombers from a thousand meters away, well outside the defensive fire of those formations. Uh, did I say that the gyro sight was the last thing I wanted to talk about? Well, there's one more last thing. It's the bubble canopy. The British were working on this pretty early, as seen here on this Miles M20 from 1940. The technology first manifested itself on U.S. aircraft in the form of the Malcolm Hood, which was popular on both British and U.S. fighters, as seen here on this Thunderbolt. And they were used on Thunderbolts, Mustangs, Spitfires, and some other things. But soon, uh, 
This turned into a full bubble type canopy, greatly improving the visibility for the pilot. Some of these British developments we've talked about are still with us and going pretty strong today. Drop tanks certainly haven't gone away. The bubble top canopy is extremely common on modern fighter planes and the gyro gun sight is still with us, although now they use radar for the range finding function. They have more advanced displays for the modern gun sights and so on. Water injection seems to sort of come and go in aviation and also in the automotive world, some post-war automobiles, including Oldsmobile, Saab, and BMW, uh, had water injection from the factory. It's still a viable technology, and there is a rumor it's about to make a comeback in general aviation. I have no idea how modern air-to-ground munitions work, but at least in principle, blind bombing through the clouds is still done, and that concept got its start via H2X and GH by the British. Dual stage supercharging with the compressors on the same shaft, at least in principle, lives on today via compressors in nearly every turbine engine in production, including those by Rolls-Royce. That's all for now. Please consider joining my Patreon where it's easy to communicate with me and where I have all the manuals used in creating this video and others. Also, uh, the super thanks function is active and greatly appreciated. Before I go, I want to reiterate this video is not meant to be a comprehensive list of all things British. But again, I think these items we talked about are those that the British don't seem to get credit for in one way or another. And I hope I've helped to change that. About a year ago, I mentioned in the comments section on one of my videos that the effects of some British stuff from World War II has been greatly exaggerated, specifically certain types of equipment, but that there were a number of things where the British effect has been understated. Quite a few of you asked me what I was talking about, so now you know. If you made it to the end of this video, thanks for watching. I sure do appreciate it. That's all for now. Goodbye and have a great day.